What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Alex Cuesta Show. How's everybody doing out there on this Wednesday, April 17th of 2024 for episode 120? Just want to start off saying thank you to everybody out there that is watching on YouTube and X. So we are on a mission right now, and we're starting a new one. On YouTube, we are sitting at right around, I think, 59 subscribers. I want to get us to 100. So if you are there watching right now, if you're listening, go ahead tell people, click that subscribe button because 100 is the goal for us. I know we can get there. And on Twitter, X, we are at 3,500, a little over 3,500 followers. I want to get to 4K. So that's our goals. And I will be announcing them every show where we are. But if you like what you hear, definitely go uh, smash that like button on YouTube. Uh, Share this, retweet, repost, whatever you want to call it on Twitter because that's the biggest way. And tell your friends about the show. Uh, You know, we always have a great time. We have great guests. So definitely go out there and do that for us. Um, Quickly, we're on a little bit of a time constraint today, and I want to jump in as fast as I can. So we're going to do our normal last week's show, had Dr. Peter Peter McCullough on. He is one of the leading epidemiologists on the planet, talked a whole bunch about COVID-19, the vaccine, and he gave us a little bit of a hint of what is uh, potentially up ahead with the bird flu pandemic that they're trying to bring about. So if you want to know more about that, go on YouTube, go watch it. It's under the live tab there and go on Courageous Discourse. It's his sub stack with John Leak, and they put things out there all the time about the medical. So that is something that absolutely everyone should go check out. But I'm going to end my intro quickly because I want to bring in our guest because we only have her for a limited time and you'll find out why. So I'm bringing her in right now. She is Nicole Solis. She is a stay at home mom in Rhode Island sued by the teachers unions for submitting public records requests about political sexual indoctrination. And she is also an education freedom center, senior fellow at independent women's forum. How's it going, Nicole? Hey, Alex, it's going good. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Now, I mean, people are listening and I don't know if everyone understands what a public records request is. And for those that are more like federal politically savvy, it is a Freedom of Information Act, right? That is essentially what it is at your state and local level. So I want to jump in right away. What? So they sued you for trying to get information. Now, what caused you to want to get information about what was going on in your school? Well, I was enrolling my daughter in kindergarten and um, I was asking questions about how they were teaching things like gender theory, um, CRT or anti-racism or DEI now, whatever you want to call it. And my school district told me that I had to submit public records requests. They told me I had to submit a public records request just to get the curriculum. So they basically said I had to send a public records request for for any question. I mean, a lot of times... um, even much later after I was sued, I I asked another question about boys and girls bathrooms and they told me again to go submit another public records request. So I did it because they told me to, that's the short answer. And um, the teachers union sued me for submitting these public records requests to harass me and to bully me and to silence me. Now they are arguing that they sued me because they wanted to protect teacher privacy, which isn't a thing when you're a public employee. No. Um, so they were afraid that if the records that I was requesting were released, that teachers would be harassed by national conservative groups in the media. So they filed this lawsuit, which was um, an injunction on mm-hmm. my public records request, and they were seeking declaratory relief in a court asking a judge to find that the privacy interests of their teachers outweighed the interests of the public to get public information. I find, you know, something crazy about that. Like I went to college. I don't know if you did any college, but in college, when you get to the beginning of the class, they give you a syllabus. That is quite literally the curriculum for the course that year. That would be like, Uh, You know, getting into a class as a college level person and going, hey, professor, do you have a syllabus? And being like, you're not allowed to know. You can't know what's going to go on in this course. What's wrong with you? Like, it is a very similar thing. And I feel like maybe that's something that I don't know if that's something you're looking to push, but maybe we should have curriculum sent home. 
from every single teacher in the public school beginning of the year. This is the curriculum. And even if it's quarterly, we do parent teacher conferences, right? Why can't we yeah. curriculums every single quarter? I feel like that should be something that is would solve a lot of problems, right? I'd imagine. It would, but you know, surprise not surprisingly, the teachers union actually fights that too. There was a bill in Rhode Island that was introduced called an uh, it was an academic transparency bill. And of course, you have the teachers union come on and they say, "Oh, we're just so busy and this is another thing our teachers have to this is so unreasonable. Oh my god, we're never going to be able to do our jobs." But, you know, here they are pouring all their time and energy into transing kids at school and developing gender identity transition protocols with gender point teams and secret gender support plans. And so, you know, this idea that it's so hard to let everyone know what you're teaching is complete baloney. And they really just don't want to be accountable for, for what they're, they're teaching. It's the easiest thing to just put everything online, including, you know, the books you're reading, the handouts. There are wonderful model bills called Academic Transparency Act. And um, actually, my lawyers at the Goldwater Institute have one. You can check it out. And it's, it's very reasonable. It's, it's just what they're teaching. And that way you don't have to go submit public records requests. So I totally agree with you. It would solve a lot of problems, but I think it would create more problems for the teachers unions and public schools who will be exposed, um, you know, for the indoctrination that they're actually doing. Now you're saying a lot of things that I don't know, like, I feel like this listenership would probably, you know, take to it well, right. They would hear it, but gender ideology, CRT, DEI, Let's start with gender ideology. What is gender ideology and what is it that they are trying to teach to kids that you find is harmful to them? Gender ideology is the belief that um, binary sex is, is not real and that everyone has a gender identity, meaning how you feel about your sex, you can feel more masculine or, or feminine. And under this theory, if you identify as the opposite sex, you should be treated as the opposite sex and then that expands into, um, you know, now as we're seeing policy changes under Title IX um, that completely erase the safety of, of women and girls in education, law, sports. So gender ideology is, um, in my own words, it's a conspiracy theory about sex that says that, you know, that human beings are not binary, sexually binary, and that there's this whole spectrum and that you can identify with all of these crazy things. I mean, yeah. if you look up all the different ways that you can identify, it's like, I mean, they're as crazy as like, and I'm making this up, but just to show you how crazy it's like you might not be. gender or something, but that might be a gender. It's, it's that crazy. Yeah. So and, mm -hmm. go, go for it, Nicole. Oh, um, so, so that's what gender ideology is. And, and the, the way that I, I actually learned about it in law school, um, but I learned that it was now seeping into the K through 12 school district when I called my principal and asked if they were teaching all of this indoctrination. And my principal told me in writing that they embed the values of gender identity into the classroom, starting in kindergarten. And in kindergarten, they also refrain from calling kids boys and girls because that would be offensive. And um, so this is something that they do in a classroom culture and they said they didn't have a set curriculum for it so that is also very concerning because they, like people think that everything in that your kid is learning is in a curriculum and that's totally not true there's things that are left out of the curriculum deliberately like mm -hmm. how they're teaching your kids that a boy can be a girl and a girl can be a boy some schools start in preschool i have a friend in rhode island who called me and said uh my four-year-old came home he he was read a book and he came home and and he said oh the teacher told me i could be a girl so they think they're teaching very young kids um, like a civil rights lesson of accepting people and um, it, like, like as if this is the new civil rights revolution and that it's kind to understand that a boy can be a girl, but, but really it's just confusing kids. It's interfering with them psychologically. And it's in my opinion, child abuse to make a four-year-old believe. I believe it certainly is. And I want to take it a little bit of a step further too, because, you know, gender ideology is based in queer theory. Queer theory is the basis of gender ideology. And one of the things about queer theory is that it is following the Marxist lines of a constant revolution. So when you're sitting there and a lot of people will notice that whenever there is a potential goal achieved, right? Like, okay, this classroom is not saying boys and girls anymore. 
okay, on to the next thing. Okay, now we need to start convincing them that there is no such thing, that you might be non-binary. It is a constant revolution. The purpose of queer theory is to never stay static because the moment something becomes a status quo, it is now bad. It is now the oppressor and we need to revolt against it. We need to have a revolution. So that is the danger. If it was as simple as saying, hey, you know what? It's okay for boys to play with Barbies and girls to play with GI Joes that, you know, and, you know, some people do things differently. Okay. I still don't want that told in schools, but if that's as far as it goes, I guess, but for them to be sitting there and whether they know or not know it, this is the theory. This is the ideology that they are putting upon these kids and they're doing it at the most vulnerable time where as parents, when you send your kids to school, a good parent will be like, Hey, don't be a jerk. You know, listen to your teacher, do what they say, you know, don't be mean. So this bright eyed, bushy tailed five, six, seven year old is trying to do everything that teacher says and is taking it as gospel. So when that teacher tells them like, no, 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 Sally's not a girl's name. Sally is just, you know, a person. They could be a boy if they want today. And, and then they're doing all this type of stuff. It is really interfering with their psyche a hundred percent. Yeah. And, and they're telling them that kindness, it's not just accepting someone that it, it's actually kindness is now girls um, suppressing their feelings of feeling unsafe and uncomfortable with a boy in their bathroom and girls mm -hmm. being told that they need therapy if they don't like having a naked man or boy in their locker room. So, so we're going through something in my local area. I'm in the Hudson Valley over here and there is a high school. I'm not going to name anything yet, um, but, and maybe not ever because um, it's not my business, but there was a male to female trans. Um, so it's a biological male saying that they're a female in one of the local schools. I want to get it right. I know sexually abused. I don't know if it was fully rape, but sexually abused the girl at that school. Nothing happened to them. And they moved to another school basically in the next town over. And it started a problem because some of the girls in the school that they're currently in found this out and started a petition. And so what happened? These peace loving individuals, this trans individual, a male was trying to fight the females that were that started the petition. And I haven't heard any public news about it. You, the only way I know about it is do my job. Because in my job, I teach individuals how to drive. So I talk to a lot of 16-year-olds in the area and things like that. Only way I found that out that that's going on. It's not big news. It's not public. It's nothing big. I, maybe I will talk to the right people to maybe make this a bigger deal because it should be something. But you know, it's exactly the type of things that you're saying, that they're teaching these individual girls that, no, you have to accept it. And I believe the girl that started the petition got suspended for doing it. Oh, I mean, <laughs> that's um, that's that's that sounds like a lawsuit to me. I mean, if you have a petition, first of all, that that raises free speech questions. And especially mm -hmm. with this flashpoint with gender ideology, there's a lot more going on there. I mean, if she needs any help. You know, I'm, I'm happy to connect her with some lawyers that are pro bono and can and might be interested in helping her. Yeah, because it, it's crazy. And it's a lot of the things what you talked about. So you have some other lawsuits um, going on. Talk about the other lawsuits that you are pursuing, um, you know, and what, what's going on there. Yeah. Um, uh, just to clarify with the teachers union lawsuit, sure. um, we're, 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 we're currently, uh, the only thing we have left to litigate is my anti-slap claim, which says that the teachers union sued me to harass me. So the teachers union withdrew their claims, which is kind of like a tacit admission of guilt. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the first lawsuit. The second lawsuit is an open meetings act lawsuit that I filed against my school district because they wouldn't let me in to see public meetings of their subcommittee that was talking about how they were going to revise curriculum and policies under what they called a racial equity lens, <laughs> which is really just like making everything racist. Yes. For example, um, they had a hiring policy that had uh, that they had drafted that had an explicit racial quota. It literally said, okay, great idea, guys. We're going to have like three people that are either black, indigenous, or a person of color. That's totally illegal to do. This is you know, just so the audience understands that's, that is not what affirmative action is. Affirm, affirmative action, which now is illegal. Um, but when it was legal, it said that you could take into account 
someone's race as one factor, but you could never hire people explicitly based on race. And this is what my school district was planning on doing until I saw the draft. And I emailed the school lawyer and I said, um, hi, are you like waiting to get sued? What are you doing? Are you going to tell your client that this, this is illegal? So um, as I understand it, I, I think the school lawyer was like helping with draft revision revisions. So she was aware of this policy. I don't think she even, she even knew it was illegal. So well, the thing is though, if you're following, if so say you have leftists on your side, what you just described isn't racist to them because their different definition of racism, since they're postmodernists and they redefine words is not the same as what me and you think me and you think discrimination on basis of race and undefining characteristic, right? right. That is what it is in their eyes. They'll, though that can't be racist. It's only racist for people of institutional power, right? So in their eyes, white people can only be racist in America because white people have the institutional power. So therefore, it is the Marxism, again, oppressor versus oppressed. So what you just described to a leftist, that's not racist. That is giving the um, people with less systematic, less systematic, less institutional power a leg up. And it is pushing for equity, which is one of the DEI things. So it's interesting because that lawyer, if that lawyer is a leftist lawyer, they're looking at you and saying, oh, racist white woman again. She <laughs> just wants to hold down colored people or I'm sorry, people of color. Because now if you rearrange the words, it's not colored people, which is the most ridiculous thing that they're. I just find it crazy that these individuals, black, brown people, I don't care, are allowing the racist leftists to do it to them again. Like they're, they're, they're actively calling themselves people of color, which is the same exact thing as colored people back in the forties, fifties, slavery times. Like it blows my mind, but I'm sorry on that little aside, um, from the lawsuit continue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so, uh, that's, that's, the second lawsuit that now I filed against my school district because my school said, "Oh, this is a um, this this is a private meeting," and I found out later they were they were paying these facilitators of this subcommittee to revise all of these policies and curriculum under a racial equity lens. So, okay, now there's public money involved. Um, they invite they the school appointed people to the board. Um, the school invited other public to other members of the public to come and once we depose the facilitator who um is an outside nonprofit um like executive director that was hired yeah. she then admitted that they excluded people based on race so they probably excluded me because i'm white and you know they're the ones that are being racist and you know yet they have this whole public school board meeting saying that I'm racist and, you know, I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying we should not be doing this. So um, that's my second lawsuit. And then the third lawsuit I filed was a public records lawsuit alleging that the school withheld records that I had requested about this, um, what they called a BIPOC advisory uh, subcommittee. BIPOC stands for Black Indigenous Person of Color. So as we were doing discovery for this OMA lawsuit, we found the records that I had requested, which were meeting minutes of this public body that, you know, they wouldn't let me see. So when I saw that, I was like, wait, they told me they didn't have any minutes. They completely lied to me. And they have to legally keep minutes of anything like this. They have yeah. To. Yeah. And, and now the school is arguing <laughs> that it's not a public body and that therefore they don't have to keep minutes. And this is a common trend that's happening around the country where your public school will create an advisory committee or at least say it's advisory when really they're outsourcing all of their official duties to this advisory committee, which is usually ideological or at least politically biased. And then this advisory committee will go to your, your school board or your school committee and say, oh, here's all of our work. We recommend you do X, Y, Z. Now go vote on it. That's all stuff that should be number one done out in the open. And, and our tax dollars. Yeah, exactly. And so this is the importance of going to your school board meetings, right? Or at least being involved and in knowing somehow, like having somebody that goes to let everybody know, like, uh, you know, we have a wonderful individual in our area. If you're friends with him or you're in the same groups, he puts all the school minutes down in a group, everything going on. So it's like, if say you don't go, you'll still be in the know, but that's the importance of going, right? Because yeah. it's your money going into that. So you need to know you're paying for that advisory committee. You're paying for them to be told, here's what you do. And, and it could be going against everything you believe in. So I just want to ask you, like, kind of on the human side for you, what type of toll is this taken on you, on your family to 
be in this battle. Like you were a stay at home mom. You were just concerned with something that you probably thought was pretty innocuous, right? Like, hey, this is a public school. I pay taxes. I just want to find something out. You probably didn't think anything of what you were doing or that it was ever going to come back to you in such a backlash. Like, so what toll has this taken on you as a person, on your family, on relationships you maybe have had in the community? Yeah, um, it's exhausting. Um, I am happy to do it because I feel compelled to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back and change anything, but I mean, it's, it's really like the biggest thing in my life and uh, apart from my kids, of course, but it's, it's also related to my kids. Um, you know, I used to just have totally different things on my mind. I was more carefree. So yeah, it's, it is stressful. Um, but I don't want to discourage people from taking a stand because it's yeah. worth it, even though it's stressful, Absolutely. it has caused me to lose friendships. Um, you know, but I've also gained really wonderful new friends. So in that sense, With my us. life. Is completely <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other, the other thing that happens is like, I lost my anonymity because my, this all started with my school district and the teachers union, like putting the spotlight on me. I was a private individual. I didn't have like a public profile. I was not involved in politics, didn't know who my representative was. And I was forced to defend myself in the spotlight because everyone was lying about me. And I had to continuously set the record straight. I had to defend my reputation. I was afraid of how people would mistreat my kids because of the way my school district and this teacher's union viciously defamed me. So, you know, this was like, uh, here I am starting out my community. I am wanted to participate. My kids are going to school. And like, you know, when you have kids, when your kids enter in kindergarten, you're oh, like, fine. oh my God, it's a whole new world, right? Yeah, you're like, yeah. the nap is over. You know, the diapers were over a while ago, but it's just like, oh my God, this is totally, I was so excited and they just ruined it for me. Yeah. You know, they, they just, they put this black cloud over something that was supposed to be just absolutely wonderful. And you know, the longer this goes on, the more sort of like angry I feel about it because I didn't deserve it. And um, but this is also why I'm, you know, still fighting where like, you know, I, I think some people might get tired and be like, oh, crap, fine. They had the meeting minutes. Let me get the minutes. I'm like, no, I want to sue them like they Absolutely. I am suing them for the meeting minutes. I'm suing them for keeping me out of the meetings. And if there's anything else I can sue them over, I'm suing them for that, too, because <laughs> they're the ones that threatened to sue me first. They're the ones that followed through with suing me and they tried yep. to ruin my life. So um, this is me taking my life back. I like it. So did you expect to get all the support that you got from conservative media? Because you kind of blew up. Uh, once people started to find out, I don't know who the first ones were, but you know, I like, I listen to blaze media a lot. I know Glenn Beck talked about you and, uh, you know, Pat Gray talked like you were at Fox news and a lot of these places gave you a lot of support. Did you expect, you know, did you feel like you were on an Island at first and then did the support give you more power to keep going? Yeah. At first, when I saw this school committee meeting agenda that had my name on it, I was posting it on Facebook and I was like, oh, guys, uh, they're, they're saying they're going to sue me. Like, what the heck? Hello? Is anyone listening? Like, what's I was like, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what, what the heck? And, and then once the media got involved, that is when my whole world opened up. I didn't know what to expect when I had my first interview with people at Fox. Yeah. Um, you know, or, or when my blog went live with legalinsurrection.com. Mm -hmm. I was told, okay, it's going to go live. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go food shopping. Like I had no idea that my phone was going to start ringing off the hook. And then my phone started ringing and I realized, oh God, I think I have to go home. I have to go talk to people. So I had no idea that once the media ball gets going, you really can't stop it. And you either respond to requests and you want to say your side, or you let the biased media railroad you and you know, try to paint you as, as a villain. And I, I wasn't going to let that happen. So I said yes to every request that I could, because, um, you know, I thought if they're handing me the microphone, I'm going to talk into it every chance I get. Now, what's your recommendation for parents that maybe aren't as, you know, well, you know, you're obviously read up on a lot of these things, like going to law school definitely helps because you learned a lot. Cause these are a lot of, these are law theories and you're also, you know, you're pretty charismatic. You're well-spoken. If you're an individual who's kind of more of like an introvert, does not like this, the spotlight, what do you believe they should do? Because not everyone's going to, you know, get on a microphone like I do, do a show every week, want to be out in the public, get on national TV, you know, have a persona. 
what way could they help if they want to do what you did without kind of being out there? Are you someone who's willing to be an advocate? Do you know advocates in other areas that will kind of speak for them? What's your recommendation there? Just investigate your school district. And you can do that by sending public records requests, even under an anonymous email account, create a Proton email account, Mm -hmm. and then they'll send you whatever records you're looking for to that account and they'll never know who you are. Um, And, you know, I I also have had parents that were too scared to go on the news. They had things happening to them that they reached out to me over with their school district. And, you know, if the news wants to talk to them, you know, it's it's big because they're not going to waste their time if it's not big. And they were too scared. A lot of them said no. And and I just want to say to those parents that um, just be yourself. You you don't have to uh, just be honest, you know, and, and people can watch anyone on TV and they're going to decide whether they believe you or not. And the more honest you are and down to earth and relatable you are, that's that's all they want to see is the truth, and which is like the hardest thing to come by now in media. Yeah, so you yeah. don't have to worry about like sounding however you think you should sound even if you're nervous, people are going to see you're nervous and they're going to see you that, that you're just a regular parent like them and you're just doing the best you can. So, um, give it a try and you'll, you'll get used to it. You know, it's like weird. Like right now I'm looking at a green light, right? Cause I know (laughs) that, that that's where my eye contact goes and I'm not looking at your face and it's kind of weird, but I know Mm -hmm. it's going to, you know, you do that with, with practice. So it's little things like that to deter you. And then, um, and then also just talk to other parents about what's going on in school. Um, I have parents email me and then suddenly the email, um, thread grows and it's like, all right, let's loop in this parent. Let's, let's loop in this people get onto a text chat. And so you really just need to know that you're not alone and just, just reach out to a parent and be like, Hey, did you hear about this thing they're doing? Is is that weird? You know, and feel them out and you just got to start somewhere. You know, you're not alone. And I would say if this is maybe a decade ago, this is a lot harder, right? Because now you're not like podcasting really isn't what it is now. Um, There weren't as many alternative news sources and it was a lot of the mainstream leftist media kind of masquerading as even, but like now there's a lot of power. Conservatives own the podcast space. So you're going to reach millions of people and you will have millions of allies uh, automatically. If you are brave enough to speak out, which I think you found out, if you're brave enough to speak out, you're brave enough to participate, then you're going to get people to say, Hey, Nicole, don't back down. We'll help you. Like we're here. Come on anytime. You have any, like, and also you do have more places like, you know, Fox News. I'm sorry. Fox News has gone left. Like they have a few good people there. I'm not a fan of Fox. I used to watch it every day, but you have Newsmax. You have One America. You have The Blaze. You have, you know, Daily Wire. There are, are so many different outlets now that if you are, if you feel the need to step up, you're not doing it alone. You know, you're just not doing it alone. And uh, honestly, one of the simplest things to do, get a, make an X account pay for that quick little blue check mark and anyone else with any sort of power that has a little um, envelope next to them, click on them and message them and let them know. Yeah. You probably will get a whole bunch of no responses, but you will get responses back from a good amount of them and they will help you. Because one thing I found out from, you know, podcasting and stuff, there are a lot of just good people out there that want to help. And you know, that's, that's would be my advice. And You know, if you want to do something like this, start a show, talk about it. If you have knowledge, like these little things, they all help. So what else should parents know about what's going on in their schools from your experience anecdotally outside? You know, is there anything else that you want to whistleblow right now on that you, you know, don't think is getting enough attention? Yeah. um, Opt your kids out of all surveys, because what happens is, is you have these outside organizations and um, in, I mean, in, in my case, in Rhode Island, even the Rhode Island Department of Education is in on it. And they're asking your kids all these really invasive personal and political questions. And then they use that data to justify more programs and initiatives that you do not agree with. Yep. So don't think you can outsmart the survey and, you know, have, you know, answer that, oh, well, you know, I'm totally normal. I'm going to answer straight. They're going to still use it against you no matter what. And if they don't have data to to um, back up what they want to do because they use this data usually to get grants. Yep. And they'll say like, oh, X percentage of kids now say they're non-binary, which means now we need more gender identity training for teachers. So don't take the survey. That's the lifeblood of the grants. Opt your kid out. Opt your kid out of all of the divisive sex ed that's teaching them that they can be trans and non-binary. You know, at least in Rhode Island, 
you have a legal right to opt out. Um, so it, all those things, like figure out what your kid doesn't have to do in school and then don't do it. And, you know, and the key word for that and the buzz name that you want to look SEL, social emotional yeah. learning. If you see social emotional learning attached to anything, opt out. Um, you know, and it's, it's guys under a lot of things. Like if you see something, if they're saying, Hey, we're trying this new thing and it is going to teach your kids character traits, or it's going to tell your kids about kindness, about inclusivity, about positivity. And those are all words that sound great at face value, but you need to understand what you are dealing with. You're dealing with people who are postmodernists, who have different definitions for the words that you know that have you defined your whole life. So if you see anything, if you hear like, um, you know, in our school district, we have the Positivity Project. I looked into it. It's backed up. It's not Castle. Castle, C-A-S-E-L, is the big social emotional learning bubble, but it is Castle approved. So it's look into those types of things. And that's where these surveys come from. If you want to know more about social emotional learning, um, you know, James never asked me to do this, but new discourses, James Lindsay, um, he has a whole podcast series and a lot of them are 300 level courses that he's just rambling, giving you great information, but he simplifies it. He does what's called bullets. If you don't have time to listen to four hour, three hour podcasts, go listen to the bullets. You'll get the ammo you need to know about what's going on. James is an incredible resource over there and he does ridiculous work. Yeah, so I've, I've learned a lot about James and you're right. He can be really, really deep diving or he can simplify it. Can I offer a simple explanation for us? What, what I think SEL is. Yes. Um, so, I mean, SEL is it's, it's basically unlicensed group therapy performed on kids in school by, uh, you know, teachers and mm -hmm. staff that are not authorized or licensed to do this kind of psychological intervention on kids. Yep. And you're right. It's pitched as like kindness and how to include everybody. An example is, and this, this was in a Facebook conversation I had with a union teacher who was criticizing me for criticizing SEL. <laughs> and she said that she had some kid in her class. I think he was like, it was like young. It was either kindergarten, first or second grade. And he said something mean to a kid did something mean and instead of handling it the way that you would normally handle it, which is you pull the kid in, aside and say, you can't do that. You need to apologize, give the eraser back, or don't say this mean word because it's normal for kids to do this. Instead, she put the kid in the center of the room and was like, everyone, let's talk about what like little Joey did and <laughs> how, how can we fix this? And Joey, how would you feel if you were in this position? And the teacher thought this was like a great way to make what Joey did a group lesson and I said to her, you just totally traumatized this kid. You yeah. shamed him. You 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 made him seem like he was like you demonized him for like taking the eraser or saying a bad name to, mm -hmm. to the kid. And I said, that's not social emotional learning. That's like social emotional abuse. Like yeah. that is totally inappropriate to do that to a kid. So I don't know how this particular teacher was trained, but it doesn't matter because these people are not, not psychiatrists or therapists and they're going to misinterpret whatever professional development they have on SEL. And it is going to create huge problems for kids because no child should be treated that way. And we, we really should just do is discipline kids and have them learn social skills on a case by case basis. The whole um, shift from doing that like normal stuff that we grew up with in, in school, um, James probably talks about it as the transformative SEL. Yep. In Rhode Island, we actually have what's called um, uh, there's the, sorry, group, the Rhode Island framework on school counseling. And that's just a really fancy way to say that Rhode Island schools are doing SEL. And if you okay. read this, you can look up this document, the Rhode Island framework on school counseling. Um, it, it specifically says that they are moving from an individual therapy model to a group or a class therapy model. And you don't want group therapy when kids are in school. It's it's an invasion of privacy and it's done by people who are not licensed therapists. And that's a, and you said the right word, group. That's another key word. Whenever they're going to group anything, that is SEL. And yeah. you know, we can go into a deep dive, Paulo Freire and all of his things that he wrote, and he kind of started a lot of this group thing and all that. But it's it's bad news, and it's something that 
essentially it is putting the values of these people and what they want on your kids. It's not allowing you to teach your kids values. And it's something that we should all be pushing back again. So be involved, um, know what's going on in your schools and be brave like Nicole, because Nicole, you're awesome. Uh, what you're doing is, you know, extremely brave and extremely difficult. And, you know, I can't imagine every single day, like, I don't know. I'd wake up a little nervous every single day, not wanting to check my phone, not wanting to check my email, like not knowing what shoe's going to drop because unfortunately teachers unions, arguably the strongest union in the country. And you're, you know, one woman taking on a juggernaut, but you have a massive army behind you. So uh, Nicole, thanks so much for coming on. This was an absolute blast. I wish I had more time with you, but alas, we are both parents. So we, we need to go and do our own thing. Um, is there anything that you would like to promote or talk about before we jump out of here? Um, yeah, so I'm a fellow with Independent Women's Forum and they they produce something called the Teacher Union Report Card every week. And it tells you about all the bad behaviors that teachers unions do. And I mean, you will be amazed when you hear about what's going on with the Massachusetts Teachers Association and how anti-Semitic they are. Um, it just gets worse and worse with the teachers unions and um, you would never know about it because it's it's really not covered in the news. Um, and then secondly, follow me on Twitter. It's Nicoletta0602. I'll be giving updates about all my lawsuits and um, hopefully continue to be advocating for school choice and academic transparency. Awesome. So yeah, definitely go out there. I'll put that at the bottom of the screen there too. Uh, Nicoletta 0602, go on there, go follow her and you'll get great information. If you are a parent watching this, if you listen to this later and you're having questions, concerns, I mean, Nicole is super accessible. Um, you know, go talk to her. If you're a concerned parent, you'll help to uh, message me, um, on the Alex Cuesta show on X. Uh, I will hook you up as much as I can as well, because this is a fight worth having. If you're not willing to do anything political, if you don't want to get involved politics. If you think it's stupid, you don't want to fight and you have kids. There is the only thing worth fighting for is your kids. So definitely go on there, go follow Nicole. Um, if you're on YouTube, smash that like button, uh, go subscribe to us X, go follow us everywhere else on social media, go search the Alex Cuesta show, spread this word of mouth. Um, I want to thank everybody for watching. Nicole, again, thank you so much for coming on. I want to thank everyone for listening. That's listening to us on a podcast at a later time. We are going to get out of here. We'll be back next week. So long, everybody. <laughs>